Happy to be here, and, and uh, Eric, uh, it's great to see you, and clearly Eric has made it home safely from Tallahassee and uh, survived the legislative session, and uh, I know he does a great job representing you all here uh, in this community, and I know that he walked out, but let me just say this, is that when you serve as the majority leader of a caucus, it is uh, an opportunity, or I would say it this way, that people tell you that you're, it's like herding cats and trying to keep everybody headed in the same direction. Uh, but one of the other responsibilities of being a majority leader is to recognize talent. And it was clear from the very beginning, and I met Eric and his wife during the campaign, and it was clear that Eric was going to be a talented member of the Florida House. He's demonstrated that very early on in his career, and I'm glad to, to call him a friend and, and certainly look forward to more great things from him. Uh, as, he, as he continues his career in the state legislature. As for Matt Klein, Matt, you, uh, you and I have known each other a long time. It's been great to watch you uh, grow and mature and, and uh, take on this role uh, here. In, well, maybe not uh, fully mature, but, but, but I will tell you, um, the, the issue that you mentioned of uh, free speech in, at the University of Florida, and Christian, I know you were involved in it as well. And it's something that uh, it's something that I think we all recognize is so important, but you don't realize how valuable it is until your First Amendment rights are actually being infringed upon. And I was proud to stand up and go into battle with you against the University of Florida administration, and I would do it every uh, every opportunity I had. So thank you for your courage to do what you did. Uh, even while you were just a, a law student at, at University of Florida because you know what's important to fight for. And I think uh, it, it is more important now for other people to understand uh, what's at stake as we move forward. And so thank you for your, for your friendship. Thank you. Um, I, I, will, I will take, uh, I, I don't want to take up too much time because in a group like this, this is really for me a treat and a pleasure to be able to answer questions and to really be able to interact. So I want to just be able to, to share briefly with you uh, about what's going on in the world and, and why right now is, is such a critical time in our nation's history. And I think we would all agree that the status quo of where America is today is unworthy of our nation's history and heritage. And I think it's because Washington, D.C. is failing us. And I think we are all very concerned, and rightfully so, about the future of America and the direction that this country is heading in. And as I travel the state and have had the opportunity to meet so many great people and listen to their stories and find out about their successes and, and their struggles and find out about their hopes and, and even some of their failures, I realize that the battle that is taking place right now in this country is no less than a fight to save America. And I think as I travel and talk to people, they recognize because it's no longer just about the type of America that prior generations are going to pass on to their children and grandchildren. People are rightfully concerned about what's taking place today. We look at the deficits and the debt. We look at gas prices and food prices, the price, the, the inflation, the, the fear of inflation, the price of gold skyrocketing, the weakening of the dollar. These are issues that, that can control the, the future direction of our country, and people are, people are concerned. And I think right now what we're doing is recognizing that it is so important for us to be in the arena, to get involved and get engaged. For those of you who don't know, I was the president of the Young Republicans in Leon County back in the 1990s, and I often heard so many people come and talk to the young Republicans and they would say, you're the future of the Republican Party. I got to tell you, you're not the future of the Republican Party. You are the Republican Party right now. You must be engaged. The future of this country hangs in the balance. And we can no longer sit back and expect the politicians in Washington, D.C. to make decisions that are in the best interest of the future of this country because we recognize that 2010 was just the very beginning. America woke up after 2008 and we saw that President Obama was not kidding around when he said that he had a vision to fundamentally transform this country, to make it into something that 
we wouldn't recognize, for those of us who believe in those foundational principles of limited government, of individual freedom, <coughs> it's not a country that we're going to recognize. We're born, people are dependent upon government for subsistence. We're more people are dependent upon government for This is the kind of America that they have envisioned. And 2010 was a tremendous moment in our country's history because the people woke up and they said, enough is enough. We want our leaders in Washington to tell it like it is. And if they're not going to get the job done, then we're going to find somebody else who will. And we sent a message to Washington. But what we've learned is that it just hasn't been quite enough. Yet. And that's why 2012 is when we must send reinforcements to Washington, D.C. to get the job done. Now, I'm often reminded about Abraham Lincoln's quote. And he once said that America is far too strong to be destroyed by outside forces. But if we fail, it will be because we falter from within. And if you think about it, we're doing it to ourselves. And it hasn't just been the Democrats. The Republicans share in the blame. For a while there, there was a blur between the two parties. No one could really tell the difference between what is a Republican and what is a Democrat. One was for big government and one was for bigger government. But I think what we're starting to see now is that real defining line, that real definition of Republicans returning and restoring to those core conservative principles, those limited government principles. That's a good thing. But we realize that there aren't enough people in Washington right now who believe in those. And we've seen it now. We've had witness to it in terms of some of the debates that have taken place up there where it hasn't just been only the Democrats, where even some Republicans haven't shared the same views and have blocked our ability to accomplish some of what the Republicans promised the voters in the 2010 election. And I think we also recognize that we're running out of time. This is the, these are the types of issues that we're facing right now that we can't continue to kick the can down the street any longer. The time gap is narrowing and every single day that we do not resolve the issues of the debt and the mounting deficits. Every day we don't solve those issues of entitlement reform and cutting spending, balancing the budget. It makes it that much harder in the future years to address those issues. We're not just trading a year of inaction for the same amount of a problem in the future. The problems get exponentially worse in the future and exponentially more difficult to solve if we don't solve them today. And I think we all recognize right now that the spending that is coming out of Washington is out of control. It's bankrupting this country. We're spending money that we no longer have. We're borrowing nearly $4 billion a day. We're borrowing in 10 days more than we were able to cut during the debate on the 2011 fiscal year budget. Clearly, we didn't do enough. And if we can't do the small things, how do we expect and how do we envision that we're going to be able to do the big things, like reform entitlement spending, like really address the issues of the solvency and sustainability of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. These are the things that are eating up our budget right now. And if we don't have the courage to provide real solutions, not only are these programs not going to be there for the people in this room, we are going to watch an American collapse as we drive our economy right off of the cliff. And now I think all of you who are following very closely understand that the next big issue on the forefront, the one that's right on the horizon and the debate in Washington is beginning right now, is over the debt ceiling. America's credit card is maxed out a 14 plus trillion dollar national debt. And we still have politicians in Washington, D.C suggesting that the best thing that we can do is raise the debt ceiling without any spending reforms or without any types of long-term concrete solutions to address 
our fiscal stability? I say no. This is a line in the sand issue for this country. And in spite of all of the rhetoric of fear mongering, of saying there's going to be economic collapse if we don't raise the debt ceiling, that the, we're going to send signals through the bond markets that are going to drive people away from investing in this country and that we're going to default on our debt. What is going to be catastrophic is the status quo. What's going to be catastrophic is staying on the same path that we're currently on. That's what this battle is all about. That's why I'm urging Republicans in Washington right now. That's why I have formed a www.attackthedebt.com to send the message to say no raising of the debt ceiling unless we have concrete proposals to reform long-term spending and that we cut spending in this year so that we can get our fiscal house back in order. I've been a longtime proponent of the balanced budget amendment, but that simply isn't enough anymore. We have to be able to pay down our debt just like any family would who's sitting at the kitchen table, who has that maxed out credit card, that knows they can't just get on the phone and call Visa and say, can we get one more credit limit increase? We have to sit down at the table and make the tough decisions in the short term and also in the long term. I love coming to young Republicans meetings because I get to ask a question. And it's very simply this. How many of you in this room believe that when you're eligible, Medicare and Social Security are going to be there for you? Not a single hand goes up. That's why you need to be engaged now. That's why this election is so important. Because you're not just the future. You have such an important stake in what is happening right now in this country. Because generations that have come before us time and time again have simply allowed these problems to now fall onto our shoulders. Too many politicians are worried about the political consequences instead of being more concerned about what are the consequences to our country if we fail to take bold and meaningful action on these issues. Because the, the debt that we're facing right now, the mounting deficits that we're facing right now, it's not just a fiscal mess. Our national debt has now become our nation's greatest national security threat. And we can't continue to keep borrowing from countries that don't share our values and interests. Because every time that America can't act on the global stage, and take that moral leadership, we lose our sovereignty. We lose our independence. In the very same way that we lose our independence because we are so dependent on foreign countries for our sources of energy. It's why I have always been, even when it wasn't popular, a supporter of drilling off Florida's coast, drilling in Anwar, and the new technologies to extract those resources from within our own country so that we can become less dependent and more energy secure, so that we don't have to have a trade imbalance that sends nearly a trillion dollars a year to foreign countries that don't like us very much. But we also need to get a rebalance in terms of our national security policy. Instead, this president has, from day one, believed in a national security platform that has engaged our enemies and distanced America from our allies. And it's made us less safe and less respected around the world. We have to have a national security platform based on peace through strength. And I think as everyone in this room would understand,